Mr. Magnuson is, is courteous enough not to assert legislative privilege and has sat there patiently, so I'm going to allow Mr. Magnuson to come speak to us now. Hey, um, good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee, and I wouldn't normally come and uh, testify. Uh, Y'all probably hear from me enough, but um, uh, some of the folks asked me to speak on their behalf, so um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things in regards to uh, to, to my position, which is against the uh, both of the proposals. Um, one of the sort of refrains that we hear from, well, there's, there's two things that I'd like to address. One of the refrains we hear from the Convention of State supporters is that this is not a constitutional convention. And um, I would point you to the definition of a constitutional convention in Black's Law Dictionary. And, and virtually every law dictionary that you look at includes uh, in the definition an amending convention. A convention to propose amendments is part of the definition of a constitutional convention. So I don't think we have to look any further than that right there, that, um, that everything that, you know, Article 5 is understood to mean a constitutional convention um, with that terminology, a convention for proposing amendments. So the, um, there's not two different kinds of things talked about in the Constitution. There's not a constitutional convention and a convention for proposing amendments. It's all the same thing. So if we have the power to call a constitutional convention, then we also have the power to call a, uh, then it's also the same thing as a convention for proposing amendments. So it's very important to keep that in mind. And we're not asking, we're not asking you to be concerned about a runaway convention. I think that is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, the thing about a convention is that it already has the, the power to propose these amendments, whatever they may be, because it is a uh, sort of a consolidation or refining of, of the power of the sovereign people. It's not that it could run away. It's that it, it's just that's the power that a convention has. So what we're saying is it has that inherently. Um, so, and, but I want to also address one other uh, issue, which is, and I agree with what Representative Taylor uh, said, you know, by and large, um, the Constitution is under attack and the federal government is out of control and we need to do something about it. But I would point your attention to this little booklet. One of the other things that we hear a lot from the Convention of States folks is that, well, um, our side doesn't have any solutions to present. And I would just say that's completely false. I don't think that, uh, I, I think we're, we're very vocal in providing solutions. And, and one very simple one, one of the things that's been addressed today is, you know, we need to wean ourselves off of federal money. Um, but this booklet will give you a very specific solution, and it's called the Doctrine of Anti-Commandeering. And it was something where uh, Sheriff Richard Mack uh, litigated this in uh, the 1990s. In 1994, of course, we had the, the Brady Bill. And it was basically forcing uh, state governments to, uh, to help to confiscate weapons from citizens. And uh, Justice Scalia penned this decision. I'll just read uh, from sort of the conclusion here. Uh, we held in New York, uh, this is referring to another case which is cited here, that Congress cannot compel the states to enact or enforce a federal regulatory program. Today we hold that the Congress cannot circumvent that prohibition by conscripting the state's offers, officers directly. The federal government may neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems, nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. It matters not whether policymaking is involved and no case-by-case -case wane of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. So what I believe Justice Scalia is saying here is that all the states have to do in order to restore the Constitution is to simply not participate in things that are unconstitutional. We simply need to say we're not going to help you to enforce the federal to, to enforce these regulations. And I think we need to have the courage to do that. We need to be able to just stand up and say, um, you know, if there's something that's that's wrong, then we're not going to help to support that. I think we would get so much further if we had that courage. And I think before we go on to bigger and better things like tinkering with the Constitution, um, we need to do what we do have the power to do, which is refuse to participate in things that are not constitutional. And um, so I'd be happy to, to talk further with any of you all on ways specifically we can apply that. But I'd encourage you to look further into this idea of anti-commandeering. And, um, and again, because I believe that's a specific solution that we can, that we can work toward. Thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you, sir. Appreciate and I, and thank your Thank you, everybody, time. for being here. I know everybody shares the, um, 
you know, common concern that, that we need to make sure America's on track. So. Right. Thank you, Joseph. Yes, sir. Appreciate it.